Chapter 7 July Oxtail Soup Preparation The cut-up oxtails are placed in a pan to cook with a chunk of onion, a clove of garlic, and salt and pepper to taste. It is advisable to add a little more water than you normally would, since you are making a soup. A good soup that's worth something has to be soupy without getting watery. Soups can cure any illness, whether physical or mental. At least, that was Chincha's firm belief. And Tita's too, although she hadn't given sufficient credit to it for quite some time. But now, it would have to be accepted as the truth. About three months ago, after tasting a spoonful of soup that Chincha had made and brought to Dr. John Brown's house, Tita had returned to her senses. She was at her high post in the window, looking through the glass at Alex, John's son, who was chasing doves on the patio. She heard John's footsteps coming up the stairs. She was eagerly awaiting his customary visit. John's words were her only link with the world. If only she could talk tell him how much his presence and his conversation meant to her. If only she could go down to Alex and kiss him like the son she didn't have, play with him until they were tired. If only she could remember how to cook so much as a couple of eggs, enjoy any kind of food. If only she could return to life. She noticed a smell that struck her, a smell that was foreign to this house. John opened the door and stood there with a tray in his hands and a bowl full of oxtail soup. Oxtail soup! She couldn't believe it. And behind John, in came Chencha, covered in tears. The embrace they exchanged was brief, because they didn't want the soup to get cold. With the first sip, Nacha appeared there at her side, stroking her hair as she ate, as she had done when she was little and was sick kissing her forehead over and over. There were all the times with Nacha, the childhood games in the kitchen, the trips to the market, the still warm tortillas, the colored apricot pits, the Christmas rolls, the smells of boiled milk, bread with cream, chocolate atole, cumin, garlic, onion. As always throughout her life, with a whiff of onion, the tears began. She cried as she hadn't cried since the day she was born. How good it was to have a long talk with Nacha, just like old times when Nacha was still alive and they had so often made oxtail soup together. Chincha and Tita laughed, reliving those moments, and they cried, remembering the steps of the recipe. At last, Tita had been able to remember a recipe. Once she had remembered the first step, chopping the onion. The onion and the garlic are chopped very fine and placed in a little oil to fry. As soon as they become transparent, the potatoes, beans, and chopped tomatoes are stirred in until the flavors meld. John interrupted these memories by bursting into the room, alarmed by the stream that was running down the stairs. When he realized it was just the dust tears, John blessed Jencha and her oxtail soup for having accomplished what none of his medicines had been able to do, making Tita weep. Sorry to have interrupted, he started to leave the room. Tita's voice stopped him. That melodious voice had not spoken a word for six months. John, please don't leave. At Tita's side, John watched her go from tears to smiles as she heard all the news and gossip from Chincha. The doctor learned that Mamá Elena had forbidden visits to Tita. In the De La Garza family, some things could be excused, but not disobedience, not questioning parental authority. Mamá Elena would never forgive Tita, crazy or not, for blaming her for the death of Roberto. She had forbidden anyone to even mention Tita's name, just as she'd done with Gertrudis. Of course, Nicholas had returned recently with the news of Gertrudis. He had actually found her working in a brothel. He had delivered her clothes to her, and she had given him a letter for Tita. Chencha gave it to her, and Tita read it to herself. Dear Tita, you can't know how grateful I am that you sent me my clothes. Fortunately, I was still here to get them.
Tomorrow I will be leaving this place, which is not where I belong. I still don't know where that is, but I know that I have to find the right place for myself somewhere. I ended up here because I felt an intense fire inside. The man who picked me up in the field, in effect, saved my life. I hope to meet him again someday. He left because I had exhausted his strength, though he hadn't managed to quench the fire inside me. Now, at last, after so many men have been with me, I feel a great relief. Perhaps someday I will return home and explain it to you. I love you, your sister Gertrudis. Tita put the letter in the pocket of her dress without a word. The fact that Chincha didn't ask her anything about the contents of the letter was a clear sign that she had already read it from one end to the other. Later, the three of them, Tita, Chincha, and John, dried the bedroom, the stairs, and the bottom floor. As they were saying goodbye, Tita told Chincha her decision never to go back to the ranch again. She asked her to tell Mama Elena. Chincha crossed the bridge between Eagle Pass and Piedras Negras for the hundredth time without even realizing it as she tried to think of the best way to break the news to Mama Elena. The watchman for both countries let her do it because they'd known her since she was a child. Besides, it was amusing to watch her go from one side to the other talking to herself and chewing on her rebozo. She felt as if her talent for invention had been paralyzed by terror. Whatever version she gave, it was sure to infuriate Mama Elena. She had to invent one in which she, at least, got off scot-free. To manage that, she had to come up with an excuse that justified her visit with Tita. Mama Elena wouldn't swallow just anything, as if she didn't know it. She envied Tita for having had the courage to refuse to go back to the ranch. She wished she could do the same, but she didn't dare. She heard talks since she was a child about the bad things that happen to women who disobey their parents and masters and leave the house. They end up in the filthy gutter of a fast life. Nervous, she twisted her rebozo around and around, trying to squeeze out the best of her lives for this situation. It never failed. When the rebozo was turned a hundred times, a tale that fit the occasion always came to her. For her, lying was a survival skill that she had picked up as soon as she had arrived at the ranch. It was better to say that Father Ignacio had sent her to collect alms than to confess she had spilled the milk by chatting in the market. The judgment earned by the two stories was completely different. Anything could be true or false depending on whether one believed it, for example, nothing she had imagined about Tita's fate had proved to be true. All these months she had been tormented, thinking of the horrible things happening to Tita away from her kitchen. Surrounded by lunatics screaming obscenities, confined in a straitjacket, eating God knows what awful food away from home. She imagined that the food in a lunatic asylum, a gringo one to boot, must be the most disgusting in the world whereas in fact, she'd found Tita looking pretty good. She'd never set foot in that house. She'd clearly been treated well in the doctor's house, and she hadn't been fed too poorly, since she looked to have put on a few pounds there. Still, no matter how much she had eaten, no one had given her anything like the beef tail soup. That's one thing you can be sure of, or else why would she have cried so hard when she ate it? Poor thing, surely now that she had left, Tita would resume weeping, tortured by memories, the thought that she would never again cook alongside Chincha. Yes, surely she was suffering deeply. Chincha could never have pictured Tita as she was then, radiant in a shiny moire inlaid satin dress, dining by moonlight and listening to a declaration of love. That would have been too much even for Chincha's feverish imagination. Tita was sitting by a fire roasting a marshmallow. Beside her, John Brown was proposing marriage. 
Sita had agreed to accompany John under a half moon to a neighbor's ranch to celebrate the neighbor's discharge from military service. John had given her a beautiful dress he had bought for her in San Antonio, Texas, some time ago. Its multicolored fabric reminded her of the dove's plumage, the feathers around their necks, but without any sad associations with the distant day when she had shut herself in the dovecote. In fact, she felt completely recovered, ready to start a new life at John's side. They sealed their engagement with a gentle kiss on the lip. Sita didn't feel the same as when Pedro had kissed her, but she hoped that her spirit, which had been dampened for so long, would eventually be kindled by the presence of this wonderful man. Finally, after walking for three hours, Chincha had the answer. As always, she had come up with the right lie. She would tell Mama Elena that she'd been passing through Eagle Pass and had seen a beggar on the street corner, dressed in filthy, tattered clothes. Moved by pity, she had gone over to give her a coin and had been shocked at the discovery that the beggar was Sita. She had escaped from the lunatic asylum and was roaming the world to pay for the crime of having insulted her mother. Chincha had invited her to come back home, but Tita had refused. She didn't feel she deserved to return and live with such a good mother, and she had asked Chincha to please tell her mother that she loved her dearly and would never forget how much she had always done for her, and she promised that as soon as she became an honest woman, she would return to be with her mother and give her all the love and respect that Mama Elena deserved. Chincha figured this lie would cover her with glory, but unfortunately she wasn't able to tell it. That night, when she got to the house, a group of bandits attacked the ranch. They raped Chincha. Mama Elena, trying to defend her honor, suffered a strong blow to her spine and was left a paraplegic, paralyzed from the waist down. She was in no condition to hear this type of news, nor was Chincha in any condition to give it. It was a good thing she hadn't said anything, because when Tita returned to the ranch after hearing about their calamity, Chincha's pious lie would have been shattered by Tita's splendid beauty and radiant energy. Her mother received her in silence. For the first time, Tita firmly held her gaze, and Mama Elena lowered hers. There was a strange light in Tita's eyes. Mama Elena had disowned her daughter. Without words, they made their mutual reproaches and thereby severed the strong tie of blood and obedience that had always bound them together, but could never be reestablished. Tita knew perfectly well that her mother felt profoundly humiliated because not only did she have to allow Tita back into her house again, but until she recovered, she needed Tita to take care of her. For that reason, Tita wanted with all her heart to give her the best possible care. She prepared her mother's meal very carefully, and especially the oxtail soup, with the good intention of serving it to her so that she would recover completely. She poured the seasoned broth with the potatoes and beans into the pan where she had placed the oxtails to cook. Once that is done, all that is necessary is to let the ingredients simmer together for half an hour, then remove from the heat and serve piping hot. Tita served the soup and took it up to her mother on a beautiful silver tray covered by a napkin whose exquisite openwork cotton had been perfectly bleached and starched. Tita waited anxiously for her mother's reaction when she had her first sip, but Mama Elena spit the soup on the bedspread and yelled to Tita to get the tray out of her sight immediately. But why? Because it is nasty and bitter, and I don't want it. Take it away, do you hear? Instead of obeying her, Tita turned away, trying not to let her mother see her frustration. She didn't understand Mama Elena's attitude. She never had understood it. It was beyond her comprehension that one person, whatever her relationship with another, could reject a kind gesture in such a brutal matter, just like that, so high-handedly. She was sure the soup was delicious. She had tasted it herself before bringing it up. It couldn't help but be good. She'd taken so much care in preparing it. 
It made her feel like a fool for having returned to the ranch to care for her mother. It would have been better to stay at John's house without ever giving a thought to the fate that might befall Mama Elena. But the pangs of her conscience wouldn't let her. The only way Tita would ever really be free of her mother was when she died, and Mama Elena wasn't ready for that. She felt an urge to run far, far away to shield the tiny flame John had coaxed up inside her from her mother's chilling presence. It was as if Mama Elena Spit had landed dead center on a fire that was about to catch and had put it out. Inside, she felt the effects of snuffing the flame. Smoke was rising into her throat, tightening into a thick knot and clouding her eyes and making her cry. She opened the door quickly and ran out at the exact moment that John arrived to visit the patient. They crashed into each other. John held her in his arms just long enough to keep her from falling. His warm embrace saved Tita from freezing. They only touched for a few seconds, but it was enough to rekindle her spirit. Tita was beginning to wonder if the feeling of peace and security that John gave her wasn't true love and not the agitation and anxiety she felt when she was with Pedro. With a real effort, she pulled away from John and left the room. Tita, come here. I told you to take this away. Doña Elena, please don't move. You'll hurt yourself. I'll remove the tray, but tell me, don't you want to eat? Mama Elena asked the doctor to lock the door and confided him her suspicions about the bitterness of the food. John replied that it might be the effect of the medicines she was taking. Certainly not, doctor. If it were the medicine, I would have this taste in my mouth all of the time, and I don't. They're putting something in my food. Curiously enough, just since Tita came back, I want you to taste it. With a smile at her malicious insinuation, John went over to taste the oxtail soup that had been left untouched on the tray. Let's see. Let's find out what they've put into your food. Mmm, delicious. It has beans, potatoes, chile, and... I can't tell very well. Some type of meat. Don't play games with me. You don't notice a bitter taste? No, Doña Elena, not at all. But if you wish, I will send it to be analyzed. I don't want you to worry. But until they give me the results, you have to eat. Then get me a good cook. Oh, but you already have the best one right here. I understand that your doctor Tita is an exceptional cook. Some day I'm going to come and ask you for her hand. You know that she can't marry, she exclaimed, gripped by violent agitation. John kept quiet. It didn't suit him to inflame Mama Elena. There was no point for he had resolved to marry Tita with or without Mama Elena's permission. He knew, too, that Tita was no longer so concerned about that absurd destiny of hers, and that as soon as she was 18 years old, they would get married. He pronounced the visit over, ordering rest for Mama Elena, and promised to send her a new cook the next day. And so he did, but Mama Elena didn't even see fit to receive her. The doctor's remark about asking for Tita's hand had opened her eyes. Clearly a romance had sprung up between those two. For some time she had suspected that Tita would like to see her vanish from this earth so she would be free to wed, not just once, but a thousand times if she felt like it. Mama Elena perceived this desire as a constant presence between them, in every little conversation, in every word, in every glance, but now there couldn't be the slightest doubt that Tita intended to poison her slowly in order to marry Dr. Brown. From that day on, she absolutely refused to eat anything that Tita had cooked. She ordered Chincha to take charge of the preparation of her meals. Chincha and no one else could serve it, and she had to taste the food in Mama Elena's presence before Mama Elena would make up her mind to eat it. This new arrangement didn't bother Tita. It was a relief to delegate to Chincha the painful duty of caring for her mother. 
so that she was free to start embroidering the bedsheet for her trousseau. She had decided to marry John as soon as her mother was better. The one who really suffered was Chincha. She was still recovering physically and mentally from the brutal attack that had been made on her, and although it might have seemed she would benefit from not having to do any other work than cooking and serving Mama Elena, it wasn't so. At first, she received the news with pleasure, but once the shouts and reproaches started, she realized that you can't have a slice without paying for the loaf. One day, Chen Xiao went to Dr. Brown to have the stitches removed where she had been torn, where she was raped, and Tita fixed the meal in her place. They thought that they'd have no problem fooling Mama Elena. When she got back, Chencha served the meal and tasted it as she always did. But when Mama Elena was given some of it to eat, she immediately detected a bitter taste. Furious, she threw the tray on the floor and ordered Chencha out of the house for having tried to deceive her. Chencha used that excuse to spend a few days in town. She needed to forget the whole business, the rape, and Mama Elena. Tita tried to convince her not to pay her mother any mind. She'd known her for years, and she knew pretty well how to manage her. Yes, child, but why should I want to add any more bitterness to the mole I've got? Let me go. Don't make trouble. Tita held her and comforted her as she had every night since her return. She couldn't see any way to draw Chencha out of her depression to dissuade her from the belief that no one would marry her after the violent attack she had suffered at the hands of the bandits. You know how men are. They all say they won't eat off a plate that isn't clean. Seeing how desperate she was, Tita decided to let her go. She knew from experience that if Chincha stayed on the ranch near her mother, she would never be saved. Only distance would allow her to heal. The following day, she sent Chincha to the village with Nicholas. Tita found she had to hire a cook. The cook quit after three days. She couldn't stand Mama Elena's demands and her terrible manners. They hired another, who only lasted two days, and another, and another, until there was no one in the village who hadn't worked at their house. The one who lasted the longest was a deaf mute. She put up with it for 15 days but she left when Mama Elena told her in signs that she was an idiot. After that, there was nothing Mama Elena could do except eat what Tita cooked, but she took every possible precaution about it. Besides insisting that Tita taste the food in front of her, she always had a glass of warm milk brought to her with her meals, and she would drink that before eating the food to counteract the effects of the bitter poison that, according to her, was dissolved in the food. Sometimes these measures alone sufficed, but occasionally she felt sharp pains in her belly, and then she took, in addition, a swig of syrup of ipecac and another of squill onion as a purgative. That did not last long. Mama Elena died within a month, racked by horrible pains accompanied by spasms and violent convulsions. At first, Tita and John had no explanation for this strange death, since clinically, Mama Elena had no other malady than her paralysis, but going through her bureau, they found the bottle of syrup of ipecac, and they deduced that Mama Elena must have been taking it secretly. John informed Tita that it was a very strong emetic that could cause death. Tita couldn't take her eyes from her mother's face during the wake. Only now, after her death, she saw her as she was for the first time and began to understand her. Anyone looking at Tita could have easily mistaken this look of recognition for a look of sorrow, but she didn't feel any sorrow. Now she finally understood the meaning of the expression fresh as a head of lettuce. That's the odd, detached way a lettuce should feel at being separated abruptly from another lettuce with which it had grown up. It would be illogical to expect it to feel pain at the separation from another lettuce with which it had never spoken, nor established any type of communication, and which it only knew from its utter leaves, unaware that there were many others hidden inside of it. She could not imagine that mouth with its bitter rictus passionately kissing someone, nor those yellowing cheeks 
flushed pink from the heat of a night of love. Still, it had happened once. Tita had discovered it too late and entirely by accident. Dressing her for the wake, Tita had removed from her belt the enormous key ring that had been chained to her as long as Tita could remember. Everything in the house was under lock and key, strictly monitored. No one could take so much as a cup of sugar from the pantry without Mama Elena's authorization. Tita recognized the keys for all the doors and nooks and crannies, but in addition to that enormous key ring, Mama Elena had a little heart-shaped locket hung around her neck, and inside it, a tiny key caught Tita's attention. She knew immediately which lock that key fit. As a child, playing hide-and-seek one day, she had hidden in Mama Elena's wardrobe. Tucked among the sheets, she had found a little box. When she waited for them to find her, she had tried to open it, but it was locked, and she couldn't. Mama Elena hadn't been playing. She wasn't one of the seekers, yet she was the one who discovered Tita by opening her wardrobe door. Mama Elena had come to get a sheet or something and had caught Tita red-handed. Tita was punished in the corn loft, where she had to take the kernels off a hundred ears of corn. Tita had felt that the punishment didn't fit the crime. Hiding with your shoes on among the clean sheets wasn't that bad. Now, with her mother dead, reading the letters contained in the box, she realized she hadn't been punished for that, but for having tried to see what was in the box, which was serious, indeed. Full of morbid curiosity, Tita opened the box. It contained a diary and a packet of letters written to Mamá Elena from someone named José Trevino. Tita put them in order by date and learned the true story of her mother's love. José was the love of her life. She hadn't been allowed to marry him because of his Negro blood in his veins. A colony of Negroes fleeing from the Civil War in the United States from the risk they ran of being lynched had come to settle near the village. Young José Trevino was the product of an illicit love affair between the elder José Trevino and a beautiful negress. When Mamá Elena's parents discovered the love that existed between their daughter and this mulatto, they were horrified and forced her into an immediate marriage with Juan de la Garza, Tita's father. This action didn't succeed in stopping her from keeping up a secret correspondence with José even after she was married, and it seemed that they hadn't limited themselves to that form of communication either, since according to the letters, Gertrudis was José's child and not her father's when she found out she was pregnant. Mamá Elena had planned to run away with José, but while she was waiting for him to appear that night, hid in the darkness of the balcony. Who should appear out of the shadows but an unknown man who attacked José for no apparent reason, eliminating him from this world? After that terrible grief, Mamá Elena resigned herself to life with her legal husband. Though for many years Juan de la Garza had been unaware of the entire story, he had learned of it just when Tita was born. He had gone to a bar to celebrate the birth of his new daughter with some friends. There, a venomous tongue had let out the information. The terrible news brought on a heart attack. That was all there was. Tita felt guilty for having discovered her mother's secret. She didn't know what to do with the letters. She thought of burning them, but she was not the one to do that. If her mother had not dared, how could she? She put everything away just as she had found it back in its place. During the funeral, Tita really wept for her mother, not for the castrating mother who had repressed Tita her entire life, but for the person who had lived a frustrated love. And she swore in front of Mama Elena's tomb that come what may, she would never renounce love. At that moment, she was convinced that John, who was always at her side, supporting her without reservation, was her true love. But then she saw a group of people approaching the mausoleum, and from a distance she made out Pedro's silhouette and Rosaura with him. And she was no longer sure of her feelings. Rosaura, displaying an enormous pregnant belly, was walking slowly. Seeing Tita, she went and embraced her, crying inconsolably. Pedro approached her in his turn. 
When Pedro took her in his arms, her body quivered like jelly. Tita blessed her mother for providing the occasion for her to see and embraced Pedro. Then she pulled away sharply. Pedro didn't deserve to have her love him so much. He had shown weakness by going away and leaving her. She could not forgive him. John took Tita's hand on the way back to the ranch, and Tita in turn took his arm to emphasize that there was something more than a friendship between them. She wanted to cause Pedro the same pain she had always felt seeing him beside her sister. Pedro watched them through slits of eyes. He didn't care a bit for the familiar way John drew Tita when she whispered something in his ear. What was going on? Tita belonged to him, and he wasn't going to let anyone take her away, especially not now that Mama Elena, the major obstacle to their union, had disappeared. Chapter 8, August, Champandongo Preparation The onion is finely chopped and fried in a little oil with the meat. While it is frying, the ground cumin and tablespoon of sugar are added. As usual, Tita was crying as she chopped the onion. The tears clouded her vision so completely that before she realized it, she cut her finger with a knife. She gave an angry cry and went back to preparing the champandongo as if nothing had happened. Right now, she didn't even have a second to take care of her wound. That evening, John was coming to ask for her hand, and she had to prepare a good supper in only half an hour. Tita didn't like to have to hurry with her cooking. She always allowed enough time to cook food perfectly, trying to organize her activities in such a way that she had the peacefulness she needed in the kitchen to be able to prepare succulent dishes exactly as they should be prepared. Now she was so late that her movements were jerky and hasty, which led to that sort of accident. The main cause of her lateness was her adorable niece, who had been born three months before, prematurely, just like Tita. The death of her mother affected Rosara so deeply that it brought on the birth of her daughter and made nursing the child an impossibility. This time, Tita couldn't or wouldn't take on the role of the wet nurse, as she'd done with her nephew. And what's more, she didn't even try, perhaps because of the devastating experience she'd had when they took the child from her. Now she knew better than to establish such an intense relationship with a child who wasn't even her own. She chose instead to provide Esperanza with the same diet Nacha had used with her when she was a tiny baby, gruels and tea. She was baptized Esperanza at Tita's request. Pedro had insisted that the child should be given the same name as Tita, Josefita, but Tita refused to hear it. She didn't want her name to influence the child's destiny. It was enough that while giving birth to her, her mother had had a series of setbacks that forced John to perform an urgent operation that saved her life, but made it impossible for her to get pregnant again. John had explained to Tita that sometimes, because of abnormalities, the placenta does not just implant in the uterus, it sends roots down into it, so that when the baby is born, the placenta does not detach. It is so firmly attached that if an inexperienced person tried to help the mother and pulled on the placenta by yanking the umbilical cord, the whole uterus would come with it. Then it would be necessary to perform an emergency operation, removing the uterus and leaving the woman unable to become pregnant for the rest of her life. Rosaura required surgery, not because John lacked experience, but because he had no other way to loosen the placenta. And so Esperanza would be the only child, the youngest child, and, worst of all, a girl. Which meant, in the family tradition, that she was the one designated to care for her mother until the end of her days. Perhaps Esperanza sank roots into her mother's womb because she knew beforehand what to expect in this world. Tita prayed that the idea of perpetuating this cruel tradition would not cross Rosaura's mind. To help that from happening, she didn't want to give her any ideas with the name, so she pressed them day and night until they agreed to call her Esperanza 
but several coincidences suggested that this child's fate would be similar to Sita's. For example, out of sheer necessity, she spent the greatest part of the day in the kitchen, since her mother couldn't take care of her, and her aunt could only take care of her in the kitchen. And with the gruels and the teas, she was growing healthier among the tastes and smells of this warm, paradisical place. That arrangement did not sit well with Rosada, who felt that Tita was keeping the child away from her too much. Once she had completely recovered from the operation, she asked that Esperanza be fed and brought back to her room to sleep, next to Rosada's bed, where she belonged. But that command came too late, for by then the child was used to being in the kitchen, and it wasn't easy to get her out of it. She cried very, very loudly when she sensed that the warmth of the stove was no longer nearby, to such a point that Tita had to carry the stew she was cooking up to the bedroom so they could fool the child, who was lulled to sleep by the smell and sensation of warmth from the pan Tita was using for cooking. Then Tita carried the enormous pan back to the kitchen and went on preparing the meal. But today the child had outshone herself. Perhaps she sensed that her aunt was thinking of getting married and departing the ranch, leaving her behind all adrift for all day long. She never stopped crying. Tita ran up and down the stairs, carrying pots of food from one end to the other. Finally, it just had to happen. The pitcher went to the well once too often. Going down the stairs for the eighth time, Tita tripped and the pan full of mole for the champondongo rolled down the steps. And with it went four hours of hard work cutting and grinding ingredients. Putting her hands to her head, Tita sat down on the steps and tried to catch her breath. She had been up since five that morning to keep from hurrying and it had all been for nothing. She would have to start over preparing the mole. Pedro couldn't have chosen a worse moment to speak to Tita, but seeing her on the stairs, apparently resting, he went over to try to convince her that she shouldn't marry John. Tita, I want to say I think your idea of marrying John is a terrible mistake. There's still time. Don't make this mistake. Please, don't agree to the marriage. Pedro, you're hardly the one to tell me what I should or shouldn't do. When you were going to get married, I didn't ask you not to do it even though your wedding destroyed me? You have your life. Now leave me in peace to have mine. It's because of just that decision, which I repent wholeheartedly, that I'm asking you to reconsider. You know quite well what the motive was that joined me to your sister, but it turned out to be a pointless act. It didn't work, and now I think it would have been better to run away with you. Well, you think so too late. Nothing can be done about it now. I entreat you, never bother me again for the rest of my life, and don't ever dare to repeat what you've just said to me. My sister might hear it, and we don't need one more unhappy person in this house. Excuse me. Ah, and let me suggest, next time you fall in love, don't be such a coward. Picking up the pan angrily, Tita went into the kitchen. Between her muttering and shoving dishes around, she finished the mole as it cooked. She went on with the preparation of the champondongo. When the meat starts to brown and the chopped tomato is added, along with the citron, the walnuts, and the almonds, cut into small pieces. The steam rising from the pan mingled with the heat given off by Tita's body. The anger she felt within her acted like yeast on bread dough. She felt it rapid rising, flowing into every last recess of her body like yeast in a small bowl. It spilled over to the outside, escaping in the form of steam through her ears, nose, and all her pores. A small part of this boundless fury was caused by her discussion with Pedro, another part by her accidents and her work in the kitchen, and the largest part by something Rosada had said a few days before. Tita, John, and Alex had been together in her sister's bedroom. John had brought his son along on his medical call because the boy missed having Tita in the house and wanted to see her again. He stuck his face up to the cradle to see Esperanza and was struck by the girl's beauty. Like all children his age, he didn't have any secrets, and he declared, Papa, I want to get married too, just like you, with this little girl. They all laughed at that, but when Rosauda explained to Alex that he couldn't, 
because this little girl was destined to take care of her until the day she died, Sita felt her hair stand on end. Only Rosada could have thought to perpetuate such an inhuman tradition. If only Rosada had burned her mouth to a crisp and had never let those words leak out, those filthy, foul, frightful, repulsive, revolting, unreasonable words. Better to have swallowed them and kept them deep in her bowels until they were putrid and worm-eaten. If only she would live long enough to prevent her sister from carrying out such a dire intention. She didn't know why she had to think about such unpleasant things at a time like this, which was supposed to be the happiest time of her life, nor why she had to feel so irritable. Perhaps Pedro had infected her with his bad temper. Since they returned to the ranch and he found out that Tita was thinking of marrying John, he had been possessed by the fury. You couldn't say so much as a word to him. He went out very early and rode around the ranch, his horse at a gallop. He returned at nightfall just in time for supper and shut himself in his room immediately afterward. Nobody had an explanation for his behavior. Some believed the thought of not having any more children hurt him deeply. Whatever it was, it seemed his rage dominated the thoughts and actions of everyone in the house. Tita was literally like water for chocolate. She was on the verge of boiling over. How irritable she was. Even the cooing she loved so much, the sound made by the doves she had reestablished under the roof of the house, a sound that had given her so much pleasure since her return. Even that noise was annoying. She felt her head about to burst like a kernel of popcorn. To prevent that from happening, she pressed both her hands against it hard. A timid tap on her shoulder made her jump. She felt an urge to punch whoever it was. Surely someone who wanted to take up more of her time. What a surprise it was to see Chincha standing in front of her. The Chincha of old, smiling and happy. Never in her life had Tita been so delighted to see her. Not even when Chincha had visited her in John's house. As usual, Chincha had dropped from the sky just when Tita needed her most. It was amazing to see the recovery Chincha had made after the state of misery and despair in which she had left. No signs remained of the trauma she had suffered. The man who had managed to erase them was standing at her side and with a huge, honest smile on his face. From a distance, Tita could tell she was dealing with a decent, quiet man, though Chencha didn't let him open his mouth any farther than to say, Jesus Martinez, at your service. After that, Chencha monopolized the conversation completely, as usual, and broke a speed record bringing Tita up to date on the events of her life. Jesus had been her first sweetheart, and he had never forgotten her. Chincha's folks had been flatly opposed to their romance, and he never would have known where to find her if it hadn't been for Chincha's going back to the village and his coming to see her. It didn't matter to him that Chincha wasn't a virgin. He married her right away. Now that Mama Elena was dead, they were coming to the ranch together with the idea of starting a new life and having lots of children and being very happy forever and ever. Chincha stopped for breath and she was turning purple and Tita took advantage of the interruptions to tell her, not talking as fast as her, but nearly, how pleased she was that she had returned to the ranch. Tomorrow they would discuss the terms of Jesus' employment. Today John was coming to ask for her hand. Pretty soon she'd be married. But she still hadn't finished the supper. Could Chincha take over so she could take a cool, soothing bath and be presentable when John arrived? Any minute now? Chincha promptly took charge, practically throwing Tita out of the kitchen. She could make champandongo, she said, with her eyes closed and her hands tied. After the meat has been cooked and drained, the next step is to fry the tortillas in oil, lightly so they don't get hard. In the dish destined for the oven, spread a layer of cream so the other ingredients don't stick, a layer of tortilla, and over a layer of the ground meat mixture, and finally the mole, covering it with the sliced cheese and the cream. Repeat this process as many times as necessary until the pan is filled. Put the pan in the oven and bake until the cheese melts and the tortillas are soft. Serve with rice and beans. What peace of mind it gave Tita to know that Chincha was in the kitchen. Now all she had to worry about was getting herself ready. She swept across the patio like a gust of wind to start the bath. 
She could count only as much as 10 minutes to bathe and get dressed, put on perfume, and do her hair adequately. She was in such a hurry that she didn't even see Pedro at the far end of the patio kicking stones. Tita stripped off her clothes, got into the shower, and the cold water fall on her. What a relief. With her eyes closed, her senses were more acute, so she could feel each drop of cold water that ran down her body. She felt her nipples grow hard as stone when the water touched them. Another stream of water ran down her back and curved like a waterfall over the round thrust of her buttocks, flowing down her firm legs to her feet. Little by little, her bad mood was passing, and her headache was going away. Suddenly, the water started to feel warmer, and it kept getting warmer and warmer until it began to burn her skin. This sometimes happened when it was hot outside, after the powerful rays of the sun had been heating the water in the tank all day. But this wasn't possible now, since first of all, it wasn't summer, and second, it was starting to get dark. Alarmed, she opened her eyes, afraid that the bathroom was on fire again, and what did she see on the other side of the planks but Pedro, watching her intently. The way Pedro's eyes were shining, it was impossible not to see them in the shadows. The way two tiny drops of dew, hidden in the weeds, can't remain unnoticed when they are struck by the first rays of the sun. Damn Pedro's eyes. Damn the carpenter who rebuilt the bathroom so it was just like the previous one, with spaces between each and every board. When Tita saw that Pedro was approaching her with lust in his eyes, she went running out of the bathroom, throwing her clothes on any which way. As fast as she could, she ran to her room and shut the door. She barely had time to finish getting dressed before Chincha came to announce that John had just arrived and was waiting in the living room. She couldn't go to receive him immediately since the table hadn't been laid. Before putting down the tablecloth, it's necessary to protect the table with a table cover so that the glasses and dishes don't make any noise when they strike it. It should be a white beige one, so the whiteness of the tablecloth is intensified. Tita gently slid it across an enormous table that seated 20 people, one that was only used on occasions like this. She was trying not to make any noise, not even to breathe, so she could hear what Rosaura, Pedro, and John were saying in the living room. The dining and living rooms were separated by a long hall. The only sound that came to Tita was a low murmur of men's voices. Pedro and John's, but she could tell from the tone of their voices that they were arguing. Instead of waiting for matters to develop, she moved quickly to put the plates, the plate covers, the glasses, the salt cellars, and the knife holders in their proper places on the table. Without pausing, she put the candles under the plate warmers that would hold the first, middle, and main courses and left them sitting ready on the sideboard. She ran to the kitchen for the Bordeaux wine that she had left in the binary. Bordeaux wine should be taken from the wine cellar several hours in advance and put in a warm spot so the gentle warming develops the flavor. But since Tita had forgotten to take it out on time, she was forced to resort to this artificial method. The only thing remaining was to place a small basket of flowers in the center of the table. But in order to preserve the natural freshness of the flowers, they should not be arranged until just before the guests are to be seated. So Tita assigned that task to Chincha, hurriedly, at least as much as her starched dress allowed, she made her way to the living room. The first sight that presented itself when she opened the door was Pedro and John in a heated discussion about the political situation of the country. It appeared that the two of them had forgotten the most elementary rules of good manners, which tell us that at a social gathering one does not bring up the subject of personalities, sad topics, or unfortunate facts, religion, or politics. Tita's entrance stopped the conversation and forced them to try to begin a conversation in a more amicable tone. In this tense atmosphere, John advanced his petition for Tita's hand. Pedro, as the man of the house, sullenly gave his approval. They started to work out the details. When they tried to fix the date for the wedding, Tita learned of John's desire to delay it for a while so he could make a trip to the northern part of the United States to bring back his only living aunt, whom he wanted to attend the ceremony. This presented a serious problem for Tita. She wanted to get away from the ranch and the proximity of Pedro as quickly as possible. 
To formalize their engagement, John handed Tita a beautiful diamond ring. Tita looked at it for a long time, shining on her finger. The glint of light it gave off reminded her of the gleam in Pedro's eyes a short time ago when he was watching her, naked, and a poem that Nacha had taught her as a child came into her head. The sun lights up a drop of dew. The drop of dew soon dries. You are the light of my eyes, my eyes. I've brought to life by you. Rosada was moved by the tears in her sister's eyes, taking them for tears of joy, and she felt a slight lifting of the guilt she sometimes suffered for having married Tita's sweetheart. Then, quite enthused, she poured them each a glass of champagne and called for a toast to the happiness of the engaged couple. When all four of them gathered together in the center of the living room to drink the toast, Pedro clinked his glass so violently against the others that it broke into a thousand pieces and their champagne was splashed onto their clothes and faces. It was a blessing that Chincha appeared at this very moment amid the reigning confusion and pronounced those magical words, Supper is served. That announcement restored the calm and good cheer that the occasion warranted, but that they had been on the point of losing. When the talk turns to eating, a subject of the greatest importance, only fools and sick men don't give it the attention it deserves. And that, not being the case here, in a fine mood, they all made their way to the dining room. During supper, everything went very smoothly, thanks to the graceful intervention Chincha provided while serving. The meal wasn't as delicious as on some other occasions, perhaps because of the bad temper Tita was in when she prepared it. But neither could you say it wasn't pleasant. Champandongo is a dish with such refined flavor that no temper can be bad enough to ruin its enjoyment. When they had finished, Tita walked John to the door and there gave him a big farewell kiss. John was thinking of leaving the following day so that he could come back as soon as possible. Returning to the kitchen, Tita thanked Chencha for the great help she'd been and then sent her to clean the room and the mattresses she would be using with her husband, Jesus. Before getting into bed, they had to make sure they wouldn't discover the undesirable presence of bedbugs in their room. The last servant who had slept there had left it infested with those little creatures, and Tita had not been able to disinfect it because of the hard work that followed the birth of Rosaura's daughter. The best way to eradicate them is to mix a glass of alcohol half an ounce of spirits of turpentine, and half an ounce of powdered camphor. Rub this preparation everywhere there are bedbugs, and they will disappear completely. Withdrawing to the kitchen, Tita began putting the pots and pans away. She still wasn't sleepy, and it was better to spend the time this way than tossing and turning in her bed. She felt a mass of conflicting emotions, and the best way to put some order in her thoughts was to start by putting some order in the kitchen. She took a huge earthenware pot and put it away in what was now the storage room, formerly the dark room. After Mama Elena's death, they saw that no one was thinking of using it as a place to bathe, since they all preferred to use the shower. So to put it to some use, they turned it into a storeroom for kitchen utensils. In one hand, she was carrying the pot, in the other, an oil lamp. She pushed her way into the storeroom, trying not to trip on all the things that stood in her path the many cooking pans that were kept there because they were not often used. The light from the lamp helped a little, but not enough. It didn't reveal a shadow that slipped silently into the room behind her and shut the door. Sensing another's presence, Tita spun around. The light clearly revealed the figure of Pedro, barring the door. Pedro, what are you doing here? Without answering, Pedro went to her, extinguished the lamp, pulled her to a brass bed that once belonged to her sister Gertrudis, and throwing himself upon her, caused her to lose her virginity and learn of true love. In her bedroom, Rosada was trying to put her daughter to sleep, but the baby was crying uncontrollably. She was walking her all around the room, but it wasn't working. As she walked past the window, she saw a strange glow coming from the dark room. Plumes of phosphorescent colors were ascending to the sky like delicate bangle lights. As many cries of alarm as she gave, calling for Tita and Pedro to come see, 
The only answer she got was from Chincha, who was looking for a set of sheets. Beholding this remarkable sight, Chincha was struck dumb with surprise for the first time in her life. Not a single sound escaped her lips. Esperanza, who was always keenly aware of what went on around her, stopped crying. Chincha knelt and crossed herself and offered up a prayer. Most holy virgin, who's up in heaven, gather up the soul of my mistress, Elena, and let her stop wandering among the shades and purgatory. What are you saying, Chincha? What are you talking about? What else can it be? Can't you see? It's a ghost of the dead, dead and still walking, paying for some unsettled score. I don't think it's no joke. I'm never going nowhere near it. Me neither. If poor Mama Elena had known that even after she was dead, her presence was enough to inspire terror, and that this fear of encountering her is what provided Tita and Pedro the perfect opportunity to profane her favorite place with impunity, rolling voluptuously on Gertrudis' bed, she would have died another hundred times over.